So I want you to think for a minute of all the different kinds of things God has asked his people to do down through the centuries. Come on, Peter. Come on out. The water's fine. I want you all to put all your armor on, get your swords and spears, and I want you to walk around this city one time for six days. Every day, six days, one time. And guess what? You don't get to say anything. Take your son, your only son, take him on a hike. Have him carry a bunch of wood. I want you to walk up to the top of Mount Moriah. Then I want you to sacrifice your only son. Sometimes we get this idea that God is this pedestrian, civilized being who would never ask us to do anything out of the ordinary. He would never challenge us to do anything that would risk our lives. He would never challenge us to do anything that would make other people think, wow, that person might just be a few cards short of a full deck. You ever had God ask you to do something difficult? You ever kind of feel like you might be hearing God's voice, but he's asking you to do something out of the ordinary? A friend of mine shared with me a story of his this last week, and I've asked him to come share it with us. Rick, would you come on up? Yeah, I walked into Lynn's office this week, and, and he threw that question at me. Has God ever asked you to do something that didn't make sense at the time? And immediately, this, story, this memory came to me. as when I was first married. I was working for Dana Corporation, and I was working second shift. And I know that sounds like a detail, but there's a reason for that detail. And so I'm at my machine at Dana Corporation. I'm running piston rings. I'm getting paid by the piecework. And I'm going at my job, and the Holy Spirit settled down over me and began to speak to my heart and mind. And he said, Rick, I want you to go visit your cousin, or your uncle. Now, I'd never been to his house. He actually was my uncle removed through divorce. But God was telling me, I want you to go visit him. I knew where he lived in Modoc, Indiana. And so I'm running piston rings, and I'm praying to myself. And I say, God, I'm in the middle of my, my shift. And I am a very conscientious worker. If I'm supposed to be at work, I'm at work. And uh, so... I'm, I'm, I, I just keep praying, and, and the Holy Spirit just keeps impressing this stronger and stronger until my heart's pounding. And I finally say, God, okay, I'll take off, and I'll go get Elaine. And so I went to my foreman. I said, you wouldn't understand why, but I'm going to have to take off the rest of the, the night. I went and got Elaine, and we drove up to Modoc, and I parked in front of the uh, my uncle's house, went to the door, no one was home. And I said, okay, God told me to come, so we'll wait. So Elaine and I sat in the car for a, an extended amount of time, and he never came home. Well, right across from his house was the church and the parsonage and of a, uh, the Nazarene church at the time, which I was familiar with. And, and so I went to the door, and I knocked on the pastor's door, and and they come in, and they invite us in. I says, my Uncle Jim lives next door. Do you know him? Oh, yeah, we know him. I says, well, do you know anything about where he might be? Oh, he works second shift. <laughs> and, and, and I was just kind of taken back. I thought, God, I know, because I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt it was God. It wasn't my imagination. The Holy Spirit was just really impacting me to do this. And so we had a wonderful time of fellowship with the pastor and his wife. But in the meantime, God had been laying on my heart to start a bus ministry where we'd go around the community and pick up children for church. And they had this little bus sitting out front. 
And I asked the pastor, I says, Pastor, is there any chance you want to sell that bus? He says, actually, I do want to sell that. And so to make a long story short, we bought the bus. Elaine and I got the bus. We started a, a bus ministry thinking of children we're going to pick up. And we did pick up children. But just up the street from my house in the country in Indiana was Mrs. Davis. She'd never been to church. Her husband wasn't religious. And she ended up getting on our bus and going to church. She found Christ. And she's now in heaven today. But at the time, it didn't make sense. God, why would you have me go up and visit my uncle, who worked second shift, which I just left second shift, to go see? So sometimes we don't understand at the time. And sometimes we may never understand. There's things God has asked me to do to this day. I don't know why he had me do them. But we can trust God and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes God asks us to do things that just simply don't make sense. Because God never intended your faith and mine to be civilized. To be pedestrian, to be calm, to be boring. You know, there's a lot of people who, who have turned away from Christ and turned away from the church because, frankly, the church is boring. My mom used to say, there's no boring, no boring situation, just boring people. And I think that if we think that God is boring, it's because we're not listening to God. God is calling us and challenging us to trust Him. To let Him stretch us, to let Him change us, to let Him do something different in our lives. When's the last time your heart beat fast for something God has called you to? Has your heart ever beat fast for something God is calling you to? In Judges chapter 4, we come across a guy named Barak. Barak is a guy who plays it safe. I don't know if Barak's heart ever beat fast for the things of God, but I think there are some things that we're going to learn about what it means to walk in faith and to, to, to have this adventure with God as we get into Judges chapter 4. If you don't happen to have a Bible with you, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. You'll want to turn to page 167. Again, if you don't own a Bible, please take that Bible home as our gift because we would love to make sure that you have the opportunity to have God's Word in your hands. As we progress into the, the book of, of Judges, things are continuing to go from bad to worse with the people of Israel. There's a king that oppresses them and God raises up a judge named Othniel. Now the thing, interesting thing about this, this first king, we're not told what he does that oppresses the people. Well, the same thing happens in the next chapter where we, where we meet Ehud. He's the one who becomes the, the judge for the people of Israel, and he delivers them from King Eglon, the king of Moab. Again, in that passage, we're not told what King Eglon does that oppresses the people. We're just told that they oppress the people. But... We know that things go from bad to worse because God gets really specific when we meet this third oppressor. This is in verse 3. There's the, the oppressor's name is Jabin, king of Canaan. And then we're introduced to the commander of his army. The man's name is Sisera. Now Sisera commands 900 chariots of iron. And now we read very specifically that he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. The, those chariots of iron were the high-tech weapons of the day. Now, 
sometimes we get afraid when somebody else is outgunned us. You know, we, we have the phrase, he brought a knife to a gunfight. David brought a stone to a sword fight, right? We, we think those, those ways, and, and we think that if somebody has better stuff than us, then we can't stand up to them. But God reminded us just before this, in the end of chapter 3, the very last verse of chapter 3, we read about a guy named Shamgar. Remember what Shamgar did? Shamgar killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad, an 8 to, eight to 10 foot stick with a sharp metal point on one end and a chisel-like edge on the other end. The, the sharp point was to get the ox to move forward and do what you wanted it to do, and the chisel was to clean off the bottom of the cart or the, the ox's hoofs. You couldn't get much more low-tech than that. And God used what Shamgar had in his hands because Shamgar applied it with his faith in God. Whatever God puts in your hands, he wants to use to accomplish what he calls you to. And can I tell you a secret? Every single one of us today is called to something. Maybe you're here today and you've, you, this is like your first time in church. Somebody drags you along and you're like, I don't even know why I'm here. God has you here maybe, just maybe, to hear about this Savior Jesus and to begin a relationship with Him. Every one of us has a calling on our lives. Sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong calling. Sometimes it's just something He wants us to do, like God called Rick to go and visit his uncle because he wanted to save Mrs. Davis. Now, when God calls, the question we have to ask ourselves is, will I say yes? And here's the secret. If you have to ask yourself, will I say yes, you've probably already lost the day. The thing I think we need to do is determine right now, determine ahead of time, when God calls, I'm simply going to do what He wants me to do. That's not what we see happening with our man Barak but we know that when God is on our side it does not matter the size of the enemy it only matters the size of our God Jesus said in Matthew with man this is impossible but with God all things are possible he can use a shepherd boy with a rock to take down a veteran giant of a man soldier he can communicate with a greedy prophet through a donkey. He can turn a materialistic taxman into a, a lavish benefactor repaying everyone he defrauded four times the amount that he stole from them. God can do anything if we will simply trust him. Now as we get into this situation with Barak, we find something different. God is acting in a different way. One of the things that you'll notice as we go throughout the book of Judges is it's always just very honest. After, after last week's message, I, I walked into one of the life classes and, and one of the people in the life class looked at me and said, I never thought I would ever hear a message on Judges 3. Now, I hope I piqued your interest if you weren't here last week. Go and read Judges 3 and see what's there. God always just tells it like it is. He does not whitewash it. He doesn't color it so that, so that his people look good. Every one of God's people make mistakes. Every one. King David. What's King David known for? Greatest king of Israel. The thing that often pops to our minds right after that is he was an adulterer. And he killed that woman's husband. Paul wrote 13 books of the, Old, of the New Testament. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for someone like Paul. And yet Paul persecuted the church and killed people in the name of his religion before he came to Christ. Every single person that you read about in the Bible is a real person. Not just a historical figure who really lived. They're not, they don't make them up even though critics of the Bible will say that. They're real people just like you and they're just like me. 
And God is saying to us through their lives, pay attention. Somebody once said that it's the wise person that learns from the mistakes of others. Or learns from, excuse me, learns from their mistakes. But it's the wiser person who learns from the mistakes of others. We can learn from the lessons of the lives of the people in the book of Judges. God did not choose to act in the same way all the time. And in this particular case, he did not speak directly to the, the one who would deliver the people of Israel. He spoke instead to, through a lady. Her name is Deborah, and she was a prophetess. Verse 4 of chapter 4 says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now, Deborah was one of, the, one of five prophetesses in the Old Testament. As one of Israel's most significant judges, she doesn't serve as a military leader. She serves instead as a civil leader. She's, she's the judge. People will, would bring their cases to her, and she would, she would give them God's mind on their situation. Deborah's name means bee, like, you know, honeybee, buzz around. And like a honeybee, in, in the role that she functioned in, she brought sweet nourishment and reinvigorated the people of, of God. She was there for them because she spoke on God's behalf. She was faithful to God. She was honest to God. She spoke with integrity. And also, as a bee is wont to do, she stung Israel's enemy with a devastating sting. Deborah was God's spokesperson. He chose her to judge for himself in Israel. But he had in mind a different person to be the deliverer. This man, Barak, as we've mentioned already, is less than confident. Verse 6 reads this way. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh, Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, take 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun, and I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go, but if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you, nevertheless... The road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now the point of that is not that God was only going to use a man. And instead he had to use a woman. He had already chosen Deborah. We know that wasn't the point. The point was about Barak and his faith. And the point is about you and me in our faith. When God calls, will we say yes? What did she say to him? How did she begin? Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, go and gather your troops? We don't know if God said something to him and he was sitting on his hands. All we know is that Deborah knows that God had said something to him. And says, hasn't God already commanded you? What are you waiting for? Go gather the troops. Well, he was waiting because maybe he was afraid. Why was he unwilling to act on God's call? Has not God called you? Why did you wait? You know, it's easy for us to look at people in the Bible and, you know, be, be a Monday morning quarterback. You know, if, if they'd have just called this play, the Broncos would have won. If they'd have just called that play. Or if, why in the world, is switching to the baseball analogy, why in the world do they always go to the bullpen in the seventh or eighth inning and then we lose the game? You know, it, this has been a season for that, right? We, we miss out on, on what is going what what we think God wants us to do 
when we stop and we turn a different direction and we don't follow after him and we don't listen to what he says why did he wait Deborah had to come to Barak again down in verse 14 Deborah said to Barak up for this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand does not the Lord go out before you so finally Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. You know, it's interesting to me, as you go through the book of Judges, in a little while we'll, we'll look at a guy named Gideon, and you may remember the story of Gideon. He starts off with, with thousands of soldiers, and then God whittles it down. He says, you got too many. And he whittles it down again. He got too many. He's just got 300. And, and he, he equips them with a, with a candle and, and a, a pot. And they're supposed to break the pot and the candle's supposed to shine all around the, the, the mountain, the hillside with just 300 guys and it's supposed to win the battle. Well, in this case, God chose 10,000 people. One thing we need to realize is that just because God might wake you up on Monday morning, tomorrow morning, and say, I want you to eat peanut butter toast, and then he wakes you up on Tuesday morning and says, I want you to eat peanut butter toast. He wakes you up on Wednesday morning and wants you to eat peanut butter toast. Guess what? If he doesn't wake you up on Thursday, that doesn't mean that you're supposed to eat peanut butter toast. God functions in different ways in every one of our lives because we're unique. And here's the thing. He's unique. He's creative. He comes up with different ways to do things because he always wants the focus to be on him. Because with us, things might be impossible, but with him, they're always possible. God is the God of yes. And it will be done. And it already is done. And that's what he wanted Barak to get, but Barak was slow to get it. I'm not going, Deb, unless you go with me. The thing that he didn't realize is that he was not ever going to go by himself. God was going to go before him. Because God plus Barak, or God plus, put your name there, is an overwhelming force. God has something he wants to accomplish in this world, in you and through you. He begins accomplishing it in you when you take that step of faith and say, yes, I am going to obey God. And then he will continue accomplishing that work through you as you venture out, as you go home, get your wife like Rick did, get in the car, drive to a place that you're not super familiar with, and you sit and wait. Behold, Isaiah says, God says in Isaiah, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces the weapons for its purpose. God's behind it all. I have also created <clears throat> the ravager to destroy. And this is the phrase. No weapon that's fashioned against you shall succeed. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me declares the Lord. When God, when God calls, there is no reason to hesitate or to wait or to be afraid. Where God leads, he proceeds. Where he guides, he will always provide. It may not be in the same way as he did the last time, and it may not be in the same way that he did for someone else. But God will always provide. And the walk of faith is a walk of danger. It's a walk of risk. It's a walk of adventure. Joy. And fulfillment. Nothing more exciting than to, to move in a direction that you did not plan to move in and for God to show up in a powerful way. Maybe some of you have stories like that. 
Maybe your journey to School of Minds, if you're a student, is one miraculous thing after another. Maybe your journey to meet your spouse was one miraculous thing after another. Maybe your journey through a physical scare, maybe a cancer scare, maybe a car accident. Those kinds of stories are stories that encourage everyone. Just as Rick shared his story, I want you to know that if you have a story that you want to share of how God's been working in your life and what He's been doing in you and through you, then we want to hear it. We want to be encouraged by it. I would encourage you to make sure you tell that story to other people. And if you have a story, shoot me an email. Send me a text. My contact information is in the worship folder. I would love to hear your story and, and let this congregation hear it because God is alive and well. He is working today. God is working in our lives today. And sometimes the greatest sin we commit against one another and against God is to not tell anyone what God's been doing, to keep it to ourselves. Barak was afraid, I think, for the same reason that the, the leading tribe of Israel, Judah, was afraid and wasn't able to dislodge some of the Canaanites from their land. And in, back in chapter 1, verse 19, we read, he, or that's Judah, the tribe, could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Way back there, they were terrified of these chariots of iron this high-tech weapon of warfare. But God knew ahead of time, remember? Where God guides, God provides. Where God leads, He precedes. So God knew this was coming, and listen to what He said back in Joshua, way before Judges. But the hill country shall be yours, for though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to the farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, listen carefully, though they have chariots of iron, though they are strong. When you are up against an enemy that is overwhelming, remember, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. And your God is bigger. He can do it. Don't be like Barak because Barak made, uh, excuse me, fear made Barak faithless. His fear made him faithless. Unchecked fear is like a metastatic cancer that moves into every area of your life. It will keep you from trusting God. It will keep you from stepping out in faith. It will keep you from allowing God to work through you to accomplish big things in this world. Now maybe in a calm and safe place like this, you might feel a little bit like Luke Skywalker did when he said, I'm not afraid. To which Yoda replied, you will be. If you choose to step out in faith, you will have reason to be afraid. Your heart will beat fast. Because if God doesn't show up, when you take some of these steps of faith, you're done. But that is where you meet God and you learn who He really is. You see, sometimes we think that we know who God is. We've got Him in our little box. God will always do this. God will always do that. I've heard people say, God would, I know this isn't God's will because He'd never ask me to do anything that risks my life or the life of my children. Take your son, your only son. Have him carry the wood. Go to the top of Mount Moriah. Sacrifice him there. Wow. Really? It pleased the Father to crush his son, Isaiah 53 says. It pleased him. We need to
to understand that God is so good. God is full of grace. God is loving. But His love extends to other people. And if, and if He can use one of His children in our suffering to reach someone else, His goodness and His love will do that if we will allow him to use us following the example of Jesus. Now that, that's the God of the Bible. That's the God we love and serve. Because we need to understand that God will often bring giants, overwhelming obstacles into our lives to reveal the fear that's in our hearts so that we don't toddle through life thinking we've got it all under control. Because frankly, as soon as we feel like we have it under control, I think it's often like God to throw something our way to help us realize that we're trusting in the wrong thing. My trust is not built on me. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Is that your life? Is that the adventure you're on right now? Are you allowing God to call the shots in your life? Have you made any decisions where somebody would look at you and say, wow, that is whacked. Don't get that at all. I remember after a big family decision, a couple of years after a big family decision, my son said to me, Dad, when you decided that we needed to do this, I thought you were crazy. But I see now. And I got to tell you, I didn't make the decision, Connie and I didn't make the decision because we were smart and we knew what was going to happen. We made the decision because we felt like God said, make this decision. And he showed up. And we would have missed out if we had said, no, we're going to play it safe. We're going to stay here. When we're faced with things that make us afraid, we can either nurse them, nurse those fears, or we can step out in faith and discover a God who's bigger than any problem, any fear, any obstacle. His purpose in challenging us is to reform our faith. To realign our faith with the true faith that he's growing in us. Miroslav Volf is a um, Croatian theologian. He's at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And I think he has his finger on the pulse of what God wants to do in our faith. As we, if, as we walk out in, in, in faith with him. He says, as it travels in time and space, the Christian faith needs regular realignments with its own deeper truth. Such realignments are termed reformations. Christians too, and not just their, um, not just their convictions, will need to keep realigning themselves to the authentic versions of their faith. Their realignments are termed renewals. I exhort us as Christians to, renew, to reform and renew our faith so as to lead lives worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Now listen carefully. These next couple of lines will penetrate your heart and mind if you will allow them. If we don't, the Christian faith may well turn out to be a curse to the world rather than a source of blessing an embodiment of the fall into temptation to live by bread alone rather than a means of resisting it. A faith insufferably self-righteous and arrogantly imposing itself on others to control and subdue them. A source of strife over worldly goods rather than a wellspring of confident humility, creative generosity, and just peace. God wants to reform and realign our faith to who he really is 
into what he really wants to accomplish in our lives. Interestingly enough, Barak's name means lightning. Slow to act. She had to prod him at least twice that we know of, but his name means lightning. And the interesting thing is, as soon as he got into the battle, you could see why he was lightning. He, he was successful. He was effective. And the Lord routed, this is verse 15, Sisera and all his chariots and all his army before Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and he fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army to Herosheth Hagoyim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. Barak's army decimated Sisera. Now we aren't told the number of, of infantry and army, you know, cavalry, I should say, that followed after um, Barak. But you can imagine that the number was probably in the tens of thousands. And they just overwhelmed these, these uh, excuse me, not Barak, but Sisera's army. Barak's army overwhelmed them. They just wiped them off the field of battle very quickly. But Barak's fear, his lack of faith in God, kept him from receiving the blessing of participating in this victory that God brought to the people of Israel. An iron chariot was unstoppable in the flatlands. That's why it was terrifying. You couldn't take them up into the hillside because they, they wouldn't be able to function there. So on the flatlands... They were unstoppable, unless you add water. And when you add water to flat earth, dirt, you get a mud puddle. And beyond that, you get a marshy, mucky dirt that makes those chariots stop and become unfunctional. Well, their field of battle was by the Kishon River. It's where they usually had their, their fights. And it, evidently, um, that's where uh, Sisera loved to have engage in battle. Well, the problem was that God got involved in this fight. Remember? Whose fight was this? It wasn't Barak's. It wasn't Israel's. It was God's. So in chapter 5, which we'll look at next week, I just want to give you a, a hint here. It's, it's a song that Deborah and, and Barak sing together. But listen to what they say. From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. So the heavens fought against Sisera. And here's how. The torrent Kishon swept them away. It rained like crazy. And it caused Kishon River to swell. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. And it, when it overflowed, it flooded that area, and those iron chariots were worthless. So here's how I know that as well. Because when you have poetry like that, it's, you, you wonder, uh, well, the imagery and things, is that really, is he reading something into that? It says that God, <clears throat> excuse me, God routed Sisera. All his chariots and his army. The word, word liter, for routed literally means disturb, confuse, harass. It's the same exact word used when back in Exodus, God fought against the Egyptians as they came down into the, into the Red Sea in their chariots. And it says that they caused their wheels to to get stuck and some of them to fly off. It's the same exact word. That is the God who intervened in this way and he routed them. Barak did not need to be afraid because this was God's battle. If God calls you to something, you and I don't need to be afraid because God has gone ahead of us. It's his battle. It's his plan. And we just need to follow him. The Lord, Yahweh, routed Sisera and all his chariots and army before Barak by the edge of his sword. So here's a little historical detail you might not have known. Not everyone in Israel's 10,000 man strong army had a sword. 
Not everyone had swords or spears at the time. Interesting. Later on, in the, as we talk about Samson and, and a couple of the other uh, judges, Gideon in particular, you find out that they still don't have swords for everybody. But verse 8 of chapter 5 says, When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. When, when the people of Israel walked away from God, they brought war to their own doorstep, is what he's saying. Was shield or a spear to be seen even among 40,000 in Israel? Take 40,000 people. Was there a shield? Was there a sword? It's just a poetic way of saying they were not plentiful. Now, in my mind, as I, as I discovered that, it gave me a new appreciation for Barak and his, his fear. But it also gave me a new appreciation for the courage of the soldiers that did say, yes, I'll follow after you, Barak. I don't know what they had in their hands. They were farmers, many of them. So they probably had their farming tools. They probably had everything they could lay their hands on because they did not want to go into battle without some sort of weapon in their hands. But they needed to realize, and they learned quickly, that this battle was God's. It was not a battle that they had to engage in. God routed Sisera with his sword. Now the battle comes to a close with Barak never quite catching up. He's always a couple steps behind what God is doing because he's not walking in faith. But Sisera, verse 17 starts, fled on, away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and she covered him up. He said to her, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks, Is anyone here, say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand, and she walked up to him softly, tiptoed up to him, you can imagine the scene, and she drove the peg into his temple until it went down into the ground while he was laying fast asleep from weariness. I told you the Bible doesn't pull, hold anything back. Meanwhile, Barak, he's still pursuing Sisera. He's out wandering around while God is using someone else to accomplish what he has in mind. I don't know about you. I don't want to be that person. I want to be right in the middle of what God's doing. I want him to be able to use me to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. And behold, verse 22 ends, as Barak was pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. Barak's too little faith made him too late to participate in God's victory. God's desire for you and me is to live in faith, not fear. And as we will live in faith, He will give us an adventure like nothing else anyone else will experience because God will treat you in a unique way. Sure, there'll be some things that are common to other people, but God has something specific that He wants to do for you. So I have both an individual and a corporate challenge for us today as I contemplate this passage. First, I want to challenge you to invite God to speak to you personally. God, what do you want to do with me? What step of faith do you want me to take today? Is there someone I need to reconcile with? Somebody has wronged me or I've wronged them and I've let it go on for a week for years is there someone God is saying God brought to your mind immediately is God saying to you I want you to reconcile with that person that'll take a huge step of faith is there someone that you know who needs to know Jesus maybe a lab partner maybe a professor maybe a parent a co-worker a neighbor is there someone that you've wronged and maybe they don't even know it. Is there someone that you need to forgive? Is there something he wants you to give up? Is there something he wants you to add? 
How does God want you to live out your faith today? What's the personal step God is asking you to take? And then corporately, we as a church have been called to be a force for good in golden and beyond, a force for God's grace in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. Is there something that God has put inside of you that we need to know about? Is there something that you think God wants this church to be about? Is there some way that, that you feel like God is saying, hey, we ought to do this. Let's talk about it. Let's hear. Is there some way that you could benefit this body? You play an instrument or sing, we'd love to have you in the band. You don't really know anybody yet. We would love to help you, help you get connected. We have, we have small groups, we call them life groups, that meet throughout the week, and they're starting up here in the next couple of weeks. You could be involved in that way. There are lots of different ministry opportunities here. If God is prodding you and prompting you, we want you to know you're welcome to be involved here. You can take that step of faith to make us all better. You know, being a member of this church means that God is not finished with us, that God has something he wants to accomplish and he's bringing you alongside of us to use your gifts and abilities to help us become everything he wants us to be. We believe that a disciple is someone who connects with God, who loves Jesus with everything they have, grows in their spiritual maturity, and engages the culture. As you think about those four things, what step of faith would God have you make? Pick one. Is there someone that needs to be engaged with? Is there some depth to your growth that needs to happen that's not there yet? I don't know how God might be speaking to your life, but I know that as God nudges you, I would encourage you to determine right now to say yes. Whatever God says, I will do it. Don't let fear keep you from participating in the victory God wants you to get to enjoy with him. I would challenge every one of us to take at least one step of faith each day this week. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity you give every single one of us to know you. I pray that if there's any here who've never put their faith and trust in you, that today they would take at least a step closer. That they would say, yes, I, I want to follow after Jesus or I want to know more. I've got questions. And God, for all of your daughters and sons who are within the hearing of my voice, speak to us, God. Help us to say yes, even now, as we hear your voice or before we hear your voice. Let us make those step of faith, steps of faith every single day this week. In Jesus' name.